Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Larry Lederman, and on behalf of the Center for International Governance Innovation, CG, I welcome you to this global policy forum in Ottawa featuring Robert Kahn. First, I would like to recognize some of our guests. The Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia, His Excellency Faiza Toku. The Ambassador of Algeria, His Excellency Hossein Megar. Uh, members of the embassies of Russia, the Netherlands, Poland, Colombia, and the Philippines. And I would also welcome members of the Canadian government, including Global Affairs, the Bank of Canada Parliament, and the Office of the Minister of International Trade, the University of Ottawa, and Carleton University, and members of the Business and Cultural Communities of Ottawa. It's now my pleasure to ask the Director of CG's Global Econom Economy Program, Domenico Lombardi, to introduce our guest speaker. Domenico. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Larry, and welcome uh, to this uh, uh, event on uh, Venezuela after the fall. So as uh, those of you who are familiar with our research agenda in the um, CG's Global Economy Program know, uh, the management of severe sovereign debt crisis is an important agenda item. And um, in uh, planning for this event, uh, I thought that there would be at least five important reasons for thinking about uh, Venezuela now. So the first is that uh, the um, political, social, and economic collapse of Venezuela seems now uh, unavoidable, almost unavoidable. And uh, when it happens, it's uh, going to materialize almost in our own backyard. Uh, the second reason is that uh, in the context of any rescue package that will have to be assembled to support uh, the ensuing economic stabilization of Venezuela, there's going to be an important geopolitical angle, a geopolitical angle given by the fact that uh, China and Russia de facto are acting as the lender of last resort to Venezuela right now. And China, as you know, uh, has been lending to several countries, both in Latin America and uh, in Africa and elsewhere. However, how China will be positioning itself uh, in the context of uh, uh, sovereign debt restructuring uh, is largely unknown. And then there is Russia. As you know, uh, there is a uh, Russia state-owned company which owns uh, a good chunk of uh, uh, the Venezuela um, um, oil refinery network in the States as a collateral, it owns the collateral, which means that should Venezuela default, it would end up owning a significant chunk of uh, um, the uh, Venezuela's own uh, oil refinery network in the United States. And clearly this poses a number of uh, uh, national security issues for the United States, um, and again, how the U.S. administration will react to that, to this development, again, is largely unknown. And then more generally, uh, there is the Trump administration that has expressed the skepticism, uh, to, to say the least, um, on uh, a broader multilateral approach to uh, in handling international issues. Um, it has appointed or nominated uh, uh, senior officials who have largely, who have uh, strongly criticized uh, large bailouts, and therefore uh, how the U.S. administration will position itself in this crisis is another further unknown. And last but not least, uh, we have seen so far at the height of the global financial crisis and um, uh, following the global financial crisis that uh, um, several regions have uh, uh, strengthened or established the regional financial arrangements. So that has been the case in the Eurozone with the European Stability Mechanism. Uh, in East Asia, um, the East Asians have strengthened the Chiang Mai Initiative. And in uh, Latin America, in the Andean region uh, in Latin America, for decades the Latin American Reserve Fund, FLAR, has been operating with a certain success. And in fact, it has already um, lent uh, um, uh, significant resources to Venezuela already. And therefore, uh, you know, how the regional financial arrangements, in this specific case, FLAR, will cooperate, will work with the IMF, 
in managing this uh, sovereign debt crisis, I think will will uh, will add an important uh, dimension to um, uh, to this debate: how regional financial arrangements and the IMF should cooperate in handling uh, um, sovereign debt crisis, with implications for international financial stability, of course. So, to talk about all these issues and more, uh, we have invited an outstanding scholar. Um, really, I, you know, an outstanding scholar, Robert Kahn, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, Rob has held uh, a number of senior positions in uh, uh, the private sector, in international financial institutions, and uh, in the U.S. government. So before joining the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Rob was uh, a senior strategist with uh, more capital management. And uh, uh, before then, was managing director uh, and head of the sovereign advisory group uh, at uh, Citigroup. Um, and then, in the international financial institutions world, he held uh, positions like senior advisor at the World Bank, was an IMF staff economist, always dealing with sovereign debt crisis in one region or another. Uh, even when it was a treasury. Uh, or the Federal Reserve, he was uh, uh, focusing on these issues. And uh, um, before before being a Treasury and the Fed, uh, he, w he also served as a senior economist in the Council of Economic Advisors. And maybe that, that has been the only instance where Rob has not dealt with sovereign debt crisis, but I could be wrong. So um, I think I have uh, talked for too long. And... Uh, as I said, uh, really, uh, I do believe that uh, we have uh, today an outstanding scholar who could really enlighten us on uh, the Venezuelan crisis and especially all the implications that this crisis uh, could have uh, for the international community and uh, especially for us here in Canada. And this is part of a CG research project that uh, um, Rob uh, um, you know, has been part of and uh, a forthcoming CG paper uh, um, you know, drawing from Rob's research um, is, is forthcoming. So he's with us today to present some of the preliminary results from this research project. So Rob, without any further ado, uh, thank you very much for being in Ottawa with us today, and uh, uh, over to you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out on this uh, wonderful day. The last time I gave a talk, it was pouring, and the weather was horrible, and I, I think most people were just happy to be inside. So I, I appreciate what the sacrifice you've made to, to come out today. Thank you to Larry Lederman for hosting this event and inviting me, and for Domenico, who has been a friend for a long time, for, for making this possible. And Domenico's done a great job of laying out some, some of the most pressing challenges that we're likely to confront uh, when, the, when this crisis comes to a head. And I'm going to do something kind of a little bit uh, maybe unusual. This. I'm going to briefly talk about the current situation, but then I'm going to ask you to come on kind of a leap of faith of, with me, or a jump, and, and to jump ahead to the, to the resolution and in a sense leave a bit uh, ambiguous how we get from here to there. But that because I think, as Domenico said, there are so many critical issues here about how, that are going to come to the fore if we get to the point where we do all as an international community come together and try and help Venezuela get back on its feet. I think probably, as all of you know, um, Venezuela has been embarked on an exercise in populist economic policies an extreme exercise to have its roots in the election. And, and Chavez's uh, election and president in 99, uh, those policies, populist, authoritarian, economic policies, redistributive, uh, obviously maintained strong support for a while, but were both, were in many, were, have been unsustainable in many respects for a long time. They were supported by very high oil prices, but I think you certainly have to highlight that the fall in oil uh, a few years ago really was a, a, a catalytic effect in drawing the unsustainability of these policies and leading the government to do increasingly uh, authoritative and, uh, and, and um, painful economic measures that have 
exacted a growing humanitarian toll and is devastating an economy in a way that's going to leave persistent effects long after this uh, near-term crisis uh, ends. Uh, you know, with oil revenues are falling, the reserves are exhausted. These are just the small day-to-day -day things. Um, the government slashes basic services. They're increasingly resorting and rationing basic food and medical supplies. Uh, and, and it's getting, you know, obviously more and more difficult to fend off uh, a default on the debt, which is what drew me to get interested in kind of how that plays out. In some sense, you could say it's a government that has defaulted on most of its other commitments except for the debt. And for reasons that might be interesting to discuss, they, though, still are willing to go to great lengths to continue to pay. But... I would argue, and my analysis is, that we are very much close to reaching the end of the road economically. And so from that perspective, uh, it is very hard to see uh, anything other than an eventual collapse, of, a full collapse of the economy. Now, as I said, I want you now to jump ahead and think about a little bit what is going to be confronting the international community what will be the, the, the challenges we face as we try to move forward in that regard. Now, a lot of it does depend on the conditions in place that day, and, and timing is always difficult. There's a lot of scenarios. Certainly, there are many people in Washington that talk about international pressure bringing the country towards free and fair elections that could lead to a democratic transition. Some of them have in mind something like what we saw in Ukraine with the Maidan and the transition there. Others, perhaps, including some of my colleagues, uh, think that may be uh, unlikely to happen and more possible, more uh, likely would be a, a change in government to something that may be authoritarian, may be uh, uh, difficult for the international community to work with in some ways, but might be less ideologically anti-market, uh, might be... Uh, more humane in policies, and also, and we'll come back to this when I talk about U.S. policy, uh, less closely connected to some of the narco-terrorist financing elements that are very problematic for the U.S. government with the current administration. But with all those factors in play, um, let's think about that scenario uh, and what could happen. And here again, I want to touch on a little bit. I want to give you an analogy to Ukraine. Because while it was a very different situation, an oil importer, but also uh, an, economy, an economy that had, had very poor economic performance over a very long period of time. Uh, in fact, the IMF had just gone to its board and said, we really sh can't work with these guys. We shouldn't be lending them money. We really shouldn't be involved. We can't support reform in an effective way. And then the Maidan happened. And there were calls made at the highest level and a decision was made, in this case first at the White House, that something had changed and that a government was coming into play that subject to extraordinary challenges needed broad international support. And it was that call, in this case coming from the White House to the IMF, that was the regime change that starts the mobilization of international support in an extraordinarily stressed time. Now here, the stress is going to come as much from the economic destruction that has been caused by the current crisis in Venezuela. We, are, we had, I think, I believe, an 18% decline in economic activity last year. We're probably going to see double digits this year. Uh, we are seeing a very sharp runoff in oil production. That is just typical of one element of across the economy kind of breakdown in, in productive capability. Uh, we have hyperinflation. Uh, the IMS forecast is 700 uh, percent. That is probably very low. Uh, I don't know um, what the um, if there's any specific number there that sort of is hyperinflation. You know, 701 is 699. But we certainly understand when we see it that a hyperinflation tends to create incentives uh, for people to pull out a productive uh, enterprise and to do things that are destructive on a long-term basis. And we're absolutely seeing that now. We're seeing a breakdown of supply chains. We're seeing a breakdown of, of capacity. And, and that's going to be the driver for what's going to have to be an urgent effort to get support to Venezuela when, that, when those policy change. Now, in my research, and, and I mean, part of this here, is, here's where a bit of the art comes in. 
because we can try and talk about how big the problem, the gap is now, how big the hole is now that the government is struggling to fill. And uh, there are estimates that say that they have what we call a financing gap, a kind of shortfall of 10 to 15 billion this year. But that doesn't have, a, in some ways, that doesn't have a lot of meaning you know, given the extensive nature of price controls the, the, and the, the, the willingness of the government to do kind of very extreme things to, to meet current payments. So what, what I've tried to do in my work is to think a little bit of when you have a rescue effort put together, when you are trying to move back towards, in steps, something that is a more of a functioning market economy, what would be the needs and who would provide it? And that's the core of the starting point of the, of, of the work that I'm doing here. Now, just as in Ukraine, the first call will go to the IMF. They have the capacity. They have the, uh, the skill set, in a sense. And they have the checkbook that would allow them to get out there quickly, mobilize, and get some money out to them. And indeed, I, I, it is hard for me to imagine, despite the stigma that IMF involvement has in Latin America, and those of you who work in the region know the difficult history that the fund has, but I will say, and I've been involved in IMF rescues on both sides of the table in places like Korea and elsewhere where there was also stigma. I arrived in Korea with the fun team, big sign, I am fired, go away, IMF. So I felt very welcome there. It was a successful program in the end. Uh, but the stigma is obviously there. But I see no alternative to the fund being involved at the center of it. Fund is playing catch up here. Let there be no doubt. The last IMF, because of a very difficult, you know, basically broken relationship between the IMF and Venezuela, uh, Chavez government you know, kicked them out, paid off the loans, and said you can't come visit, even visit us. Uh, it's essentially against the law for a government official to talk to the IMF, essentially, pretty much, all but. Uh, the last IMF uh, article for which is their annual review of the economy, a comprehensive review that all members agree to do, I believe was 2004. The last time an IMF team visited Venezuela was 2007. I'm aware of one member of the fund staff who's been on one of those missions. Uh, so they're starting from zero, and that's going to make it very difficult. But they, will be, they would be able to move quickly and put together a program they're going to have to do it with tremendous speed because when they get there on the ground, they're going to see a lot of misery. They're going to see a dysfunctional economy. They're going to be under huge pressure to try and get things started again. Speed is actually going to be a challenge for them because the way you tend to put these programs together, particularly when you have so little information, is to collect the information, build the teams, negotiate. Oh, they'll, they could easily tell you a story that could take you three to six months to get a program together. So issue number one for the international community in this will be basically to t make sure the fund is comfortable and has the political backing to break those rules to move very quickly. There's trade-offs when you move quickly. You're moving with a lot of bad information. You can end up being, with a lot, you know, embarrassing yourself because you go with a program and you say, here's the economy, and then three weeks later you're saying, uh, except it's not, and here's the real economy. I mentioned earlier I was involved in Korea where in the beginning of, in November of 1997, we had a program together. It failed in three weeks. We said, told everyone that they had 30 billion in reserves. They, at the time, they really had three. You know, but it was the desire to, be, to move very quickly and respond to the need. And the fund's going to have to very much do that, but it is going to involve some trade-offs. What might a program look like that the IMF would put together under that kind of immense pressure in the field? I'll give you a couple. I'll give, I'll give you Rob's plan, uh, which they're not committed to, but it is drawn on experience of other efforts in these kind of emergency cases, post-crisis, post-conflict um, kind of stories. Number one, there would have to be a unification of the exchange rate, and it would have to be allowed broadly to float. Once again, breaking a certain amount of, of China in the Latin American context, given a difficult experience of floating. But reserves are essentially exhausted. And um, they don't have the money to do it. And in fact, a program would want to rebuild reserves over time. 
they now, as part of this process of increasingly putting restrictive controls in the economy, they've introduced this multiple tier exchange rate system, if any of you are aware of it, with an extraordinary range of values to it. The official rate is 10. Uh, the, there's a parallel rate if you get permission to do it, which I think last time I looked was something like about, um, I wrote it down here and now I forgot, I think it's um, 700 or so, and then um, uh, the black market rate is 6,000. It was 500 a year ago. So that gives you a sense of the price distortions, but it also, by the way, it's a challenge, you know, it means that essentially uh, in an environment where the fund comes out and says, look, this is badly distorted all the price signals in the economy. We have to have a single price for foreign goods. We're going to have to have a single exchange rate. We can't afford anything else anyway. We're going to unify. We're going to let the exchange rate go where it will. That, though, is going to create huge dislocations uh, to which they're going to have to be responsive to it. But I see no alternative to an exchange rate float. And part of my, what I've done in my scenarios is think about some different uh, exchange rates as to where it might settle. Uh, without getting too much in the weeds of my old professor's theories, these exchange rates tend to overshoot in the short run and then come back. And so uh, you have to be a little careful. But it does mean in the beginning that you could have an exchange rate that's actually closer to that black market rate than to the, to the official rate. So float the exchange rate. Two, rapidly increase energy prices to world levels, rapidly meaning in a couple of years, in steps. Why do you do that? Well, the fund has a lot of research. There's actually some really good papers they've written a couple of years ago on how distortive uh, subsidized energy is in an economy like this. Uh, essentially, it, it, it does distort the whole supply chain. It also becomes a critical element of the social safety net, right? Free, ga free gas, and r wealthy people can heat their swimming pools with, with it. Access to that free gas becomes a major corruptive Cool. And, but, but the idea that it becomes a core part of the social safety net, aside from making it hard to figure out what the real fiscal position is, that's my problem, uh, not theirs, but it does create this extraordinary distortion. Some estimates are that the state, and we don't really know, but the state energy company, PDVSA, probably is running a deficit somewhere in the order of 15% of GDP. That's a big number. It's not financeable. The fund will not want to finance it. And as I said, it distorts prices throughout the economy. And so I've got to believe that a core element of this will be to raise these energy prices in a number of steps in, in terms of the domestic use uh, to world energy levels. But it does destroy the safety net. And so the third thing is you've got to get a new safety net up and running. And you've got to decide how much to cut elsewhere, and how fast to do that. Those of you who follow Greece will know that we had this big debate about austerity and how fast to cut. And there was a kind of lesson that IMF took out of that, that you have to be a little careful about cutting fiscal too fast, particularly when growth in the region is, is weak. And so they call it the fiscal multiplier, but essentially it says that you have spillover effects on demand, and it, it's, if you have a stronger growth environment, it's easier to adjust to these kind of price changes and shocks. It's absolutely going to be the case here. I think the big call here for the f fund will be how much austerity they, this country should and, sh and will be asked to tolerate. Um, and here, once again, the, the, everybody should have a say in it. Um, it's hard. I have to give the fun. I have to tell. Give it. It's not an easy thing. Um, you know, a lot of these numbers, this 15% number, some of it is just simply corruption and payouts to vested individuals, and so some of that fiscal consolidation is not going to be felt in a general recession. It's a transfer stopped, but some of it is, as I said, it's part of the safety net, and so to cut it will actually uh, cause a recessionary. Draw, uh, fat, you know, uh, multiplier there, which you really need to be concerned about. I think you're going to have to kind of lean against maybe some of the instincts of some of those at the fund, although I would say the team that's working in Venezuela is very sensitive to this, but you probably have to lean on some others to say, avoid, be very careful to avoid too much austerity in this environment because you could destroy a new government that you want to succeed. I remember with the new... Um, Ukraine government just used them again, that they, they had real trouble establishing credibility when they came in. Now, those were guys that had really never governed before. They really didn't even know where, the, where the, you know, the wheels were that you were supposed to turn. 
but to starve them of re- starve a con- government like that of resources, almost to condemn it to failure. But that's going to be a big international thing, and it ties very much into this issue of moving energy prices up. What's the fiscal? I mean, let me just say, if you, if, you know, right now in an environment of pegged exchange rates, you have a large external deficit in Venezuela. And that's the way, historically, the IMF would think about deficit. You have a balance of payments deficit. The fund provides the financing. When you unify the exchange rate and float it, and then you do these kind of fiscal changes, you actually find that the external position adjusts. The exchange rate moves to, to bring the current account into balance, it's, but the fiscal position explodes. And it's, it's very much uh, difficult to judge it, but I could easily tell you a story in which the fiscal deficit before measures could be even larger than that PDVSA deficit in that first moment. So this is an issue of how much fiscal financing to get the balance right between the necessary adjustments towards a market economy on the one hand and, and avoiding excess of austerity. If you err towards not forcing too tight an adjustment, though, you need more financing, and I, that's why I, I'm going to come back to that point. There's other things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to fix the banks. Uh, traditionally, in these kind of crises, the ones I've worked on, uh, first rule is the banking problem is always worse than you thought it was. And if you think it's bad, it's still going to be worse. And yes, the financial markets are repressed in Venezuela. It's going to be bad. There's going to be non-performing loans. There's going to be corruption. There's going to be... It's going to be messy. And though a lot of those, and, and some of them, those costs can be put onto the shareholders of those institutions, but the government will end up absorbing a good chunk of it. That will add to the debt. It will add to the fiscal position. It will add to the financing need. You want to have rule of law, but it takes a long time to do this. And in an emergency program, you have to prioritize, I think, these fiscal measures. All of this leads to what I think could be a financing need that could be on the order of, uh, I'll try and give some context to this, 40 to $50 billion over two years for Venezuela. This is in a hundred economy that I think at the exchange rate I'm expecting to happen will be about a $100 billion economy. So you're talking about a financing need that could be as much as 50% of GDP over two years which is an extraordinary need. It is extraordinary relative to the Venezuelan economy. And by the way, it is also extraordinary relative to what governments will be prepared to put in. And that's what gets you to the sovereign debt issues, which, which animate me so much. But before we get there, you have to ask how much should and will the, the IMF want to put in on its own. It's an interesting time for them. In late 2015, 2016, in response to kind of the European crises and the challenges there, also in response to uh, some things Russia has done in other countries, they revamped their lending rules and their debt rules in a series of uh, papers that were put out. We haven't had a big sovereign debt crisis since then. So this is going to be the first test of these sparkly, spangly new rules that the IMF has. That's good and bad. I think the new rules in many respects improved on a policy-making process. Europe had showed some flaws in, in the way in which the IMF acted vis-a-vis its members. But it, you know, sometimes it produces a degree of legal rigidity because you will have people there, and we have to do exactly what the, what the new rules say. And, uh, and I, as I talk about in the paper, there are going to be some respects in which the new rules aren't really, weren't really ridden with this kind of crisis situation in mind. Still, those rules are the rules. What they, in essence, did, and and this gets, and I won't go into too much detail on it other than to say the IMF under its rules tends to lends to countries based on how much the fund that the country has put into the institution, its so-called quota. Venezuela has a small quota. They haven't traditionally been a big contributor to the fund. And that means that under its traditional rules, they would not get a lot of money. Um, from the IMF acting alone. The IMF can come. They have a facility, by the way, called a rapid financing facility where they can put some money in almost immediately, even before the program's been designed. That would be $1.9 billion for a country with the quota of the size of Venezuela's. Not nearly, uh, it helps. It's good. But it's not going to sort the problem out. So pretty quickly, huge pressure on the IMF. Get some money out. Get a program going. And they're saying, but we don't have all the pieces. We don't know the size of the hole in the banking system and all of that. They won't be able to wait. They have a set of rules. We call them the exceptional access rules. This is part of what was changed in 2015. 
which say that when there are special cases uh, like this, you can go beyond your normal lending limits. You can lend a lot more. And indeed, in most of the uh, major cases you will, have know, you will know about, they have been recently exceptional. I've, we, we talk about the Lake Wobegon IMF, where all the children are exceptional, right? or at least above average in that sense. And it's absolutely the case. And this will have to be exceptional access. The problem is the new rules tell us that in those cases, we have to have a higher standard for, not, for knowing that the debt is going to be sustainable. And we have a new set of procedures in place for when we aren't sure, what the fund calls the gray area, that make it more likely to, that there's going to be a restructuring. And so already we have a set of rules put in place that were designed to kind of, in response to Europe, to say, to avoid having the fund getting too involved in a country that might end up needing, not paying. A set of, excuse me, a set of rules that are saying, guys, this is exactly the kind of case where we need to have a restructuring. Now, there are some outs. If I knew the markets were coming back and there was market financing to fill this possibly $50 billion gap, fine. But I don't. I think you can be, you can be confident that we're not going to be talking about a world in which markets will come back quickly. Uh, and so, and they have certain ideas about what kind of level of debt is sustainable in the gray area. There's a couple of different ways you can look at it. Uh, there's a lot of analysis, and usually we look at things like debt to GDP. But if I'm right about what happens to the exchange rate, if I'm right about how much debt there is, 120 to 150 billion dollars after the fall, with debt with a GDP of 100, that is a debt ratio well above 100 percent for a country with these challenges. No economist would find that sustainable, even if we said, "Well, look, Rob, you know GDP. What does that mean in dollars uh, given this kind of uncertainty? Let's look at say debt to." Ex oil exports, a better measure, um, which is a fair challenge. Uh, oil exports have been dramatically falling because of lack of investment and other policies of the government. So now this debt would be about four times annual export earnings. Also massively more than would be reasonable to, to ask them to pay. So on both of those, we can look at other things, the net payments that are due. Uh, I've looked at a variety of measures. They are flashing red on all of these measures. So on a strict calculation of sustainability, it would be extraordinarily difficult at that moment for the fund to say anything, but this debt is unsustainable and must be, there must be an operation to do it. And I think that was, that's very much where I, where I come from. Now, it's even, you know, it's even, it is a more complicated political judgment because debt restructuring decisions are always inherently a burden sharing calculation. And some of the pressure, as we saw in Greece in 2012, after two years of the, the official community bailing out Greece and seeing the money turning around and leaving, that sometimes a debt restructuring decision is as much about burden sharing. And certainly in this case, I'm going to argue that if we're going to get a package that fills the financing need, the major players are not going to want to see their money going back out the door, particularly given the history of Venezuela. And so even for that reason alone, even if the indicators were a little more mixed, we're in an environment here where uh, the pressures to restructure are going to be profound. Now, this is going to be a monstrously difficult debt restructure, as Domenico touched on, because the way in which the government has chosen to, to issue debt, the legal contracts vary tr dramatically. Those of you who may have followed in Argentina, there was some, some poor legal drafting that created huge legal nightmares for the, for the Argentine government. It's worse here and more complicated. Uh, the, there's more debt and more, more obligors, uh, more locations. The asset issues are complicated. Domenico mentioned the Citco refinery holdings. Uh, Venezuela's been in a fire sale of assets over the last year to make payments. Even then, they've often, had to, they've often been late on it. Uh, they've pledged assets multiple times. There is a producer's effect, if you like that movie, where they, they bring in everybody and pledge Citco holdings again and again and again, and now the courts are trying to decide who actually has it. Uh, although I think I agree with Domenico, probably it's Rosneft in the end of the day. But all this means, once again, uh, uh, there are going to be tremendous incentives to, for, for creditors to race for assets, to race for attachment, and to hold out. And extremely hard to come together and do a debt restructuring and get the kind of comprehensive participation that would allow the country to move forward. Uh, there are, the lawyers are thinking about it. 
And there are some very aggressive legal tools that are being considered, uh, but it will be challenging even in the best of worlds. So you've got a messy legal environment, you've got an extraordinarily difficult economic environment, but you have a large financing gap that I would argue will drive it. Um, going back to Ukraine one last time, and I'll stop using that example. When, the, when Ukraine restructured its debt, the IMF uh, did what they often do. They wanted to set parameters for the deal so that the deal on the debt restructuring that came out was consistent with their program. But they didn't want to micromanage the negotiation. At the end of the day, they wanted the country to go get advisors and go out and sit and meet with their creditors and cut a deal that financed their macroeconomic objectives. At the end of the day, that creates the ownership the fund wanted. The fund does need to set, so if you will, it's sort of like what we would call principal agent problem, where they're trying to sort of define the thing but not actually dictate the final terms. That's tricky and it can lead to very messy politics. It can also lead to messy economic outcomes. In the Ukraine case, they said we, they gave um, basically uh, three conditions. They set a limit on what debt to GDP would be. Can't be above this level after the deal. They set a cash flow because like here, at the end of the day, it was really about financing that program. We need $15.3 billion from this deal in savings over the next couple of years. And that just happened to be just enough to, to, to fill the financing need. And they said, no humps. We don't want you like doing a deal that has this huge payment due the moment, the, the day after our program ends. So you've met our terms. And these are kind of core conditions, and it would be the starting point of a Venezuela effort. <coughs> Ukraine, many of us feel, got a bad deal. And part of it was in the negotiations under pressure. First of all, they had these multiple conditions, and they weren't quite sure how to balance them. Should I put the emphasis on cash flow? Should I put the emphasis on lowering the debt? And in the end, maybe it was kind of a mixed bag that satisfied no one. But the bigger problem in Ukraine was that uh, what I would call the optionality problem, that the creditors basically were disagreeing with the Ukrainians on how bad their situation was and how much relief they needed, and convinced the Ukrainians to give them basically what we call a clawback, to say, look, we think you're going to grow faster than you say you're going to grow. So if you grow faster, we want our debt relief we gave you back. Okay? So optionality on economic outcomes. Now, optionality can be a good way in a debt negotiation of bridging differences. But it can also be really expensive for the creditor. So now let's think about in this case. You're going to have a creditor that's going to come in here, and the government's going to say, we're broke. The fund is going to say, we have a huge financing need. Uh, we need you to give generously and often. And these creditors are going to say, wait a second, you have the world's largest oil reserves, you're super rich, markets are going to come roaring back. And the fund's going to say, well, we, we can't believe in that, and this could be years before we're really back. No, 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 these guys are rich, we shouldn't be giving relief in this environment. One way to bridge that would be to create optionality, in this case, linking to oil. And it's very easy to create warrants or other options or other kinds of financial and Other emerging markets and debt restructures, Ecuador in the 90s was one I worked on, have used this kind of optionality on oil. And, and often it's in a menu where some investors will take it, some won't. The, mess, the lesson from the past experience with optionality is it's really expensive for countries. Argentina did a GDP warrant, which proved to be very expensive. There's a paper just out this week, if you're really into this stuff, uh, where the fund is actually out promoting that, that in Industrial countries start issuing debt to GDP bonds. That it would create more uh, counter cyclicality if it's done right for governments to link their debt payments to have more of an equity component to debt. And as a general rule, they think it's a really good thing. But if you look at it, there's a section in there on debt restructuring where they say, well, but in a debt restructuring, often countries pay way too much. And so the big concern here, while here's the tension and here's a policy question, is going to be. How, do we allow this? In other words, do we take advantage of the way that this is a natural way of bridging these differences between creditors and debtors? Or are we concerned that, in essence, it's going to be an extraordinarily expensive uh, price tag for him? This kind of gets at that bottom line, which is, you know, that this government is going to need significant relief on its debt. Creditors are going to be unwill, un, unhappy about it, understandably so. They are going to feel like they have legal recourse. And so finding a way to incentivize them to come along and have an appropriate sharing, and it's going to be one of a profound engineering challenge, but also a policy challenge as well. 
Let me talk then about the Russia and China role, because this, this takes what is now, at this point, a bit of a technical thing. You have an IMF coming out and, and doing it. But even before I do that, let's talk for a moment about the other elements of the package. Because the IMF will want to put together as much partner financing. That private debt restructuring is part of the partner financing. They will, as Domenico said, they will turn to the other, element, other key players in the international community. The World Bank has a very limited program in Venezuela, but they have the capacity to be involved, but it will take time to gear up. They might be do, able to do some sectoral work that gets some money out pretty quickly, but like the fund, it's going to be hard to gear up, and they'll probably even be slower in doing so. The Inter-American Development Bank, from what I can tell, are ready to go. They're excited to play a role. And there is some element in which politically, as a friendlier face vis-a-vis -vis elements of Latin America, the IADB could play a very constructive role in talking about this program, the need for it, particularly given, as I say, the stigma associated with some of the elements of it. Um, my speculation is they're going to have an ask for this. And the ask is going to be they're going to want a capital increase. And if you've been following our budget politics in the U.S., that is going to be a big issue. So all of a sudden, so at the one hand, I want everyone on the plane. I want everyone going. I don't want it stalled by a negotiation. But we should not be naive. There are some big politics involved with bringing these other players in. Uh, we, we faced this, by the way, when Eastern Europe had their problems in, in the late 2000s, and the EBRD rushed out and put a lot of money into Eastern Europe and then said, and now, guys, I want my capital increase, and they got it. But that was for different times. So once again, international issue is U.S. is going to be the sticking point, but all of us should care is going to be uh, how do we want them. Uh, there's FLAR, there's, and I, I, do, I, I do want to, I know I'm running a little over, I apologize for that, but um, there will be an important role for regional financing. I do think a Friends of Venezuela, perhaps spearheaded by the Colombians, has some merit, and so we have that as well. But we still need Russia and China involved, briefly. China is the largest creditor. As Domenico said, what they do here is going to be precedential for them across the world. With all these commodity exporting countries they have lent to over the past years and are going to say, I want what she's having. Okay? This is really tough for China. And yet, we need them to be working hand in hand with the fund, with the G20, with the U.S. government. And this is going to be really hard. They're not a member of the Paris Club of International Creditors, so there's not explicit rules. We're going to have to be doing this in the shadows. But we need them involved, and we need close coordination. And somebody's going to have to help facilitate that. I think they're a willing partner, but they are very concerned about the precedent element. The biggest problem is Russia. And that is because of Rosneft, a sanctioned company. They are going to have, the day after PDVSA defaults, they have this controlling interest in a U.S. refinery network. They will have controlling interest. They will have strong interest in joint ventures that have U.S. partners. Violation of sanctions. Already, this has become an issue in the Congress, and there has been a letter to the Treasury, and the Treasury has agreed to, to do a review. We have a committee called CFIUS, which looks at foreign investment. This is an unusual thing. It's not a direct investment, but it will have CFIUS will rule on. Is there a national security issue? They will have the potent, They have the possibility of going to the president and saying, "You must tell Rosneft to sell." If Rosneft says, no, thank you, well, how will the U.S. respond? With tr there are a variety of remedies that I've been looking at. Nobody knows. But once again, this has the potential to become an explosive confrontational issue. If in energy, which is a hugely sensitive issue in the United States, it is seen as the Russians playing games, given what else is going on in our politics right now. But let me just, so that is a sort of a list of the challenges we face. Let me just conclude both with a positive note and a call to action. Positive note. For all the risks I've laid out, this is also an opportunity, as an, I'm speaking on candidly as an American, that it is an opportunity to convince the most important policymakers on this that multilateralism works, and that in particular that an IMF coalition can serve the public good, including U.S. interests. And I'm old enough to remember that a, a similarly ideological Reagan administration in 82 came around when they realized that uh, Mex the IMF was the only player that couldn't take the lead on a Mexico debt deal. 
In 2002, John Taylor, Under Secretary of the Treasury, very anti-IMF bailout, uh, but yet after a Uruguay deal that worked very well after Brazil, after the IMF played a big role in Brazil, came around and said the IMF is a strong ally of the U.S., and it was fundamental. So I do see opportunity when these things go well. As I said, you know, it's sort of like a, a small war far away. Uh, a small battle far, far away which forces us to come together and address these challenges as hard as they are can be transformational at a time where multilateralism is really in retreat. So that is my hopeful final. But I think also a call to action, because as I've thought a lot about this, I do very, worry very much that given everything else that is going on, a U.S. administration is going to be find it very difficult to be proactive in addressing these kind of issues. And so there, a role for the international community, and in particular for governments like the Canadian government, which historically have played a bridging and negotiating role in arguing for these kind of uh, collective actions, I think could be critically important in this environment. Thank you very much. My question is about getting there. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. there is a counter. There is an example that you didn't cite, and that's Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Uh, Maduro seems to mm -hmm. be establishing control over the politics of the country, outlying the the Congress, and he has control over the instruments of repression. Yes. Why can't he do what Mugabe did, and yeah. what are the consequences of that for the sorts of things you've been talking about? Yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right, and in fact, I have a colleague who says uses that says uses that uh, weekly on me, and I think you're right. I mean, econ we economists start by often start by looking at an economic dynamic and saying it's unsustainable, and therefore something that is unsustainable must stop sustaining, right, and collapse. And we have runs. We have a lot of models that explain how something that is unsustainable a year from now becomes unsustainable today, right? And all our analysis tends to point to that. You are absolutely right to say, however that political power can, can stop those kind of processes. And particularly if you have a government that's willing to use oppressive measures and where those leaders have, see themselves as having no alternative is, uh, has the potential that this could drag on. And I have tried to be very careful in a lot of my work on this to avoid sort of starting to try and predict um, what I can say, so yes, I mean, that's right. And so absolutely, and you see this in some of the efforts the Colombian government has done to give off-ramps to some members of it. What I can say, and a little bit I'm channeling some of my colleagues at CFR on this. I think, number one, you could say we have seen some fray. I think it's absolutely right to say that this government has skillfully used the rents of the available resources to sustain, to sustain that coalition, Right? and to sustain power. But the resources that are available to that end are shrinking. And we watch the rig count on oil go down every month. We watch, uh, we watch you know, greater food shortages, health problems getting worse and worse. And we are also seeing, and this is maybe a small thing, but to the extent that debt is the last thing they are still paying on, right? Since about October of last year, they have had real trouble making payments, and they have gone to ex more and more extreme methods to make them. They've been late in the rear. They did this Rosneft deal, which was a giveaway of these um, Citgo assets. Uh, they've done bearer bonds. And for those of you who are in financial issues, you know, you're doing that for a very specific reason. I mean, if you're going to the, you're doing things to do it, and more recently they, they kind of, I think, um, they've done some market transactions which are pretty, which are unusual. So we are certainly, from a financial engineering perspective, getting evidence that they really are running out of the tools that they have sustained them for the last several years. The other thing I will say, and this is way outside my, my field of expertise, but it's something we do kind of talk about a little bit in the context of the new administration, is there have been other administrations in the past that would have set a high bar for what would be the democratic values of an administration they would work with and that they would mobilize. Because this is going to be a really hard lift for the U.S., for the IMF, for, for you guys, for everybody, right? You know, one 
and I did mention this sort of a scenario which sometimes is talked about where you would get a change in government which would be notionally still chauvinista but would be more pragmatic, more willing to work with the West, willing to do these kind of more market-oriented policies. I, I, I'm not speaking the politics so much of it, but, but I, I, I do know, I can tell you that there is a lot of discussion about whether or not the administration, this administration, might be more sooner ready to support uh, an international effort in support of that kind of government. It's a hypothesis and the like. But I think more of that form of thing, that I just see more and more pressures of the sort that, yes, there is Zimbabwe, but there are, and most times, you do see countries that get to this point with hyperinflation and the corrosive effects of it, with exhaustion reserves actually do collapse because they can no longer control you know, the resources that are needed. My name is Andrew Cardoza with the Pearson Center. Um, very interesting roadmap. Is it your sense that the IMF or the World Bank or anybody else is thinking about the collapse in advance and getting prepared for it, number one? And number two is if there is a desire to do something major by the IMF, can the Trump administration kill it? Can they put the kibosh to it? It's sort of, is this going to be a new, a test of the new world order of multilateralism or not multilateralism? Uh, my basic answer is yes. I don't think kill it is a little too sharp. You know, the fund as a matter of principle supports all members. And so as a member. Um, if a majority of the fund's membership wanted a program, wanted the, the team to go out, the team would go out. And, um, you know, but I, there are many, many examples over the years where a strong, strong U.S. opposition led to the program never reaching it. And even more, maybe my concern is it could lead, if you had an administration that said, we don't support, but we won't go to the wall to, to stop it, you end up with a program doomed to failure. Because as I, I really do fundamentally believe that we're going to be in an environment now where unless you make, make this government effective and give it sufficient cash to do it, you know, and if you came in with a kind of austerity first approach, which could be just driven by the fact that if it's just the IMF and a little bit of money, if, you know, a couple hundred million from FLAR and a couple hundred million from the world, you know, a couple, maybe a two, three billion from the bank and the IDB, that is nowhere, that's going to be an extraordinary, you know, austere and, and shockingly rapid adjustment. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think the odds of failure on that would be very high. So I think it is a test of can we do multilateralism. And the successful programs in the past have been multilateral, both in terms of broad official endorse support, and in this case, a debt restructuring. But for all countries, I think without, and, and, then, and also if it's without the US, I, don't, I think getting China and Russia to be generous is gonna be extraordinarily challenging too. And, and is it your sense that anybody's thinking about it? Oh, I'm sorry. Yet? So, the IMF is thinking about it, but the way they are structured, I mean, with teams, they, they are limited by a lack of data and an inability to be out in the field. Um, if you were in an environment where there was a regular dialogue where they were going every two or three months and then the country comes and asks for money, you know, in a sense, they would know all the data. They would, the data is terrible. They do read all the reports that come back, usually from investors who go out there. But the data is terrible, and they don't have the relationships, and there's just real limits on what they know. I mean, I, I, I'm empathetic to what the challenge is. They're worried about it. They're spending as much on it as they can. But I think their view is we just, in, until I come in, I can speculate, but I think they're more careful than I am, and they would say until we get out there, we really don't know. I know there are people in the U.S. administration, both in the former administration and the current one, who are very aware of it. Uh, Rex Tillerson, deeply involved in Venezuela, his time at Exxon, um, until recently the top international person at the, in, in the U.S. In, in the White House was someone who had been very involved in Venezuela. Uh, there are people in play who absolutely know a lot about the issues. I think, and maybe we can save this part of it for the, for the drinks thing, the, the challenge of understanding how that leads, crystallizes into a policy decision in the current environment is really challenging. And I'm not, you can tell me, oh, well, these guys are really good. These are guardrails against a bad decision. I, I don't trust the fact that there are guardrails right now. So, I, I, I mean, I think I say there's people thinking about it. 
Um, I know there are people thinking about it in this city, and certainly the Chinese are spending a lot of time on it. Uh, they're owed about 18 to 20 billion. They've lent about 50 over the last several years. They're deeply invested. But I don't, I worry that it's not happening in a way that will crystallize in decision making that would go in the right direction. That's my, that's part of what brings me here. Um, I, you know, of course, everybody here hopes that, yeah, Ken Johnston, sorry. Um, we all hope that uh, the solution you put forward works. Um, the economics are interesting, elegant, uh, etc. But the politics are very messy. Um, I mean, some recent examples of uh, serious debt problems uh, include Greece and in, include, as you pointed out, Ukraine. But in both cases, the creditors had more skin in the in the game than I think would be the case with Venezuela. It'd be interesting if you comment about that. I find it difficult to, to know exactly what Washington, what the United States, would feel that it was obligated uh, to in terms of uh, Venezuela, for instance. Um, and on, on the side of the Venezuelans, um, at least in, I think, in the case of Greece and um, certainly Ukraine, you did have governments with some sort of stability in place to negotiate with. But my understanding is that the opposition is extremely mixed at this point in, in Venezuela and uh, bordering really on the point of, the, of, of chaos. So I'm wondering how you would... The early, in, in the early days of the, Ukraine, of the Maidan, you know, the first, in the first days of that new Ukrainian government, there were some experienced people, but there were a lot of new people too. Um, and, I've been involved, I remember the breakup of the former Soviet Union was another example where you ended up with extraordinarily inexperienced governments coming in and there was a debt restructuring and operation, although that is a strong official element. Uh, I find your point on more skin in the game as a, as, a, as a debt issue pretty interesting. I'm not sure I agree with it in the sense, oh yeah, yes, Venezuela is small and kind of the in the sense relative to a Greece or a... Yeah, and I was thinking that you know, you know, a major credit in the case of Greece was ECB. And yeah. Obviously. Well, it is absolutely right that in Greece in 2015, 14, 15, you had two major governmental blocks, right, that were willing to write large checks. And so aside from whatever you thought of debt sustainability, and I, to be honest, I thought they should have restructured from the start. You didn't have to restructure in Ukraine, the first program, just as you didn't have to restructure in 2010. We can say we didn't do it because of contagion. Point was, there was, a, there was enough official money coming in that you didn't need to. Right? You're right to say, and, and this is the animating thing, there is no big official check. The U.S. is, you know, we, we could, you could see a billion or two in loan guarantees, but we're not going to write a large check on our own. And there's, so there's no official bilateral contributor to help fill this gap. And that is what makes the debt issue so pressing. Um, I do think in terms of the creditors, I mean, you can have some dedic very dedicated Latin American investors that are big into here. Uh, you're not going to have, like you did in uh, Ukraine, one big U.S. investor who's very important has, like, too much of the debt, and that becomes a political issue. Uh, we don't have that there. Uh, there are going to be, and this gets into a little bit in the debt weeds, um, there's a big debate going on about whether you should have creditor committees or not, and part of that also speaks to the politics of it. But I, you're right. The bigger, broader political question is what is the interest, particularly of the U.S., but uh, in, in making this deal happen? You know, it is in our neighborhood. It is a oil exporter. Uh, it does have, you know, extraordinarily large reserves. The upside of a successful resolution of this is important. And I think as part of an international-led coalition, actually can be very pot at a time where U.S. relationships with the Southern Hemisphere have been frayed with NAFTA and other things. Uh, this is actually one on which there will be common interest in doing it. Uh, is that going to be enough? Uh, I can't say, uh, but I, you know, I, I can make you a case that they will do it. The president did have in um, the wife of a Venezuelan diplomat into the Oval Office. I mean, there have been elements, and who knows who made that happen, and you know, that's part of the whole si the game that's going on. Line but there certainly are elements of the Republican coalition um, that, you know, to the extent you can bring Venezuela back to the 
to the markets uh, would see that very positively and would tie it into a freedom agenda. Of course, other people that want the elections and they've been very tied with the opposition. You're absolutely right. The opposition just doesn't have, has no experience in terms of governing. There are people who are very prominent economists like Ricardo Hausman, but you know, uh, it would be an extraordinary challenge if they came in tomorrow. Just briefly, what then, um, I mean, we all hope that the kind of solution you're putting forward is what eventually takes place, but if it doesn't, what happens? Right, I think, it, I think, okay, part of mine is what my, my old professor, uh, Rudy Dormish, used to say, which is that, you know, it, 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 these kind of things take much longer to happen than economists will expect, for the reasons we've been talking about. And then, they, and then they happen all at once. It takes forever and then it takes a day. So part of it is I do think we get lulled into the Zimbabwe kind of storytelling and then it happens. And we're not. I put aside the fact that they kind of, they managed to pump up reserves last week through a de an operation which is creating a lot of uh, news. Uh, I'm convinced that even if the politics can be sustained, they will be forced to default they will simply be unable to make them. They will run out of, they are selling assets at a rapid rate at increasingly high prices, even if they have enough guns and political control to put down the protests and to sustain them. I'm willing to go out and say, eventually there must be a default here. That's the inevitability. And then the politics question, which maybe I'll put back to people in the room who are thought about, you know, they have been so tied to debt payment as a validation of their strength and the like. I do, I at least could question, would that default be a game changer in terms of the politics? But I am pretty confident they will eventually have to default because they will run out of extraordinary measures. One last question. Uh, hi, so Marc-Andre Poirier from Minister Champagne's office. Um, Minister Champagne is the Minister of International Trade. Trade. So we're wondering, I'm wondering, um, what is the role you think Mercosur might play in all of this? And if uh, after that you yeah. could give some thoughts on a uh, potential Mercosur-Canada free trade agreement. <laughs> I should, uh, I'm going to pass on the latter one, not because it isn't important, but I can't possibly tell say anything that would add to your knowledge okay. base on that. I've been, I, I, in the con, we, in, Dominican and I have been having some back and forth, and I've been looking at all the kind of multi, you know, because we are interested in this sort of multi, the regional development angle, and so I was looking into the Mercosur. But my instinct, this goes back to my Fed days when I worked on regional integration issues at the Fed, is of course that Mercosur has a pretty difficult history, right, in these type of things, often because uh, the lack of enforceability makes these, the, the lines that are at the core of a successful trade facilitation area to make them, in a sense, junior debt in crisis. It's fine in good times, but when you get to these difficult times, they become, in essence, the debt you don't have to pay. And so you see these lines exhausted. Also keep in mind, you know, um, because 90%, at least in the current environment, 90% of Venezuela's exports, really a little more, are oil or related products. I'm not sure that a regional trade initiative is so central there are bigger problems to getting that oil going again out of the ground. It's heavy crude. They can't pump. Everything's being you know, stolen or broken. It's broken. And those are the bigger problems. You fix that, I think the financing would come back for oil exports. And then also, and I think so, so I don't see Mercosur as maybe being, I'd love to be wrong on this, be pushed back on it, but that I don't see it as critical to restarting the economy. What might be interesting, if I'm right on the exchange rate and you get that massive depreciation with unification, at some point, not immediately, given the crisis, the uncertainty, the difficult investment environment, but certainly when you start to see the seeds of recovery, you start to see new industries develop that were not viable at the old official exchange rate. Remember, you know, those of you who remember Venezuela, I was talking before, remember Venezuela in the 70s and 80s, and my first trip to Venezuela was 86. It was a period of overvaluation, but extraordinarily resource-rich country, well-trained, educated people. This could, they could do a lot of stuff. Now, the oil rents and the oil over, the, oil, the Dutch disease problem was evident even then. But, but you know, there, there, I've got to believe that you have the capacity. And maybe then there'd be an interesting kind of set of things to think about in terms of taking some chance or encouraging financing for new, uh, new industry.
Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Larry. I've got an easy job and I've got a great job. And let me tell you why that is. I have an easy job because my job tonight is to thank our speaker. And that's easy to do for two principal reasons. Um, number one, you gave cogent, thoughtful, and challenging remarks. And number two, you're a great speaker. So thank you very much to Robert. And I have a great job. And what I mean by that is I get to work at the Center for International Governance Innovation every day, which is a think tank based in Waterloo. And when we're there, we're working on some of the most challenging contemporary policy challenges uh, that global governance knows. This is one of them. And I get to work with people like Robert and Domenico. And when I hear things like, Argentina. Do you remember Argentina? Yeah, this one's much worse. Uh, I get stressed. But then I get, I'm comforted by the fact that I get to work with, with people like you, and I know that individuals like Robert Kahn have turned his mind to this problem. And I view this very much as the start of the conversation, and I actually mean that literally. This is not the end of the conversation. Rather, this is the start. We're going to be heading to our reception where we can actually continue the conversation. So thank you to the audience for coming. Thank you to Larry. Thank you to Domenico. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, I had asked you to join me in thanking our speaker, Mr. Kahn.